Hello, everyone. We're going to give one more minute uh, for folks signing in, and we will get started shortly. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Carrie Warwick Smith, and I'm Vice President of Public Policy at the Association of Community College Trustees. Uh, we're thrilled that you've all registered for the Community College National Legislative Summit, jointly hosted by ACCT and our sister organization, the American Association of Community Colleges. Uh, this uh, NLS for 2023 uh, will be a really important session as it is the start of a new Congress and we have many new members to meet. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna start with some uh, quick introductions of our panelists today uh, and go over the agenda and then turn it over to my colleagues who are going to help you in the first step of preparation for National Legislative Summit. Uh, so today I'm joined by David Bame, who's Senior Vice President of Government Relations at AACC. Jim Hermes, who is his colleague, uh, Associate Vice President of Government Relations at AACC, as well as two of my colleagues here at ACCT, Jose Miranda, Director of Government Relations, and Rosario Duran, Senior Government Relations Associate. So today's webinar, we're going to have three main uh, sections to cover. We're going to start off with a federal update. Uh, to share uh, the latest in Washington as Congress is still very busy leading up to the holidays. Then we're going to cover key factors for the 118th Congress uh, to help inform your preparation for your visit in February. And then finally, we're going to go through a preparation timeline uh, recommending key steps for December, January, and the beginning of February uh, as you prepare to join us here in Washington. Uh, we will have a question and answer session at the end. Uh, as a reminder, we are recording this webinar, so you will be able to refer back to it. And other participants for NLS who may not have been able to join us in person today will be able to use that recording as well. So if you have questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat as you think of them or jot them down on your desk, and we will do Q&A uh, for all three sections at the end. Uh, so with that, let me turn it over. Uh, for the federal update and the 118th uh, Congress uh, notes to our colleagues at AACC. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Carrie, uh, and thanks everyone for being with us today. We're looking forward to seeing you all at the uh, at the NLS in a couple of months. Um, so it's December 13th today, uh, so we're really getting down to the nitty gritty in terms of Congress finishing out the year. And as is typical for uh, Congress, they have left uh, quite a bit on their plate uh, to get done in what is uh, a lame duck session this year, it being after the election. Um, and you can see on this slide, some of the things that are still on Congress's agenda for the rest of the year and, uh, and are moving forward. But the two biggest ones uh, are the uh, annual appropriations bills, um, uh, which could take a number of shapes, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, and the National Defense Authorization Act, which is the bill that they pass every year, or they have passed it every year, uh, to um, uh, set the stage and funding levels for the uh, defense programs, as the name implies. Uh, so Congress is actually right on the verge of doing the NDAA um, and, uh, and is trying to move forward on the funding uh, but there are also uh, several smaller pieces of legislation that they're trying to get done, many of which, if they do move forward, would hitch a ride most likely to the omnibus appropriations bill if that moves forward, um, as it's very hard to move a smaller piece of legislation on a standalone basis at this point in the year. Uh, but you can see some of the list there, uh, and including uh, in those, of course, is something that we've been working on for some time and continue to advocate for and see if there's an opportunity to move forward, and that is a short-term workforce Pell. 
uh, and um, uh, we're trying to find an avenue to adding that to the omnibus bill. Omnibus bill. I won't go into too much detail. Uh, there are some obstacles along the way in terms of doing that, but that is one thing that we are working on. And another one uh, that's uh, called tax extenders here on the slide. Our biggest issue there is a piece of legislation that would make tax uh, Pell Grants completely tax-free and also uh, remove the offset that someone um, uh, receives if they get a Pell Grant that offsets their eligibility for the American Opportunity Tax Credit. So we continue to work on that in terms of adding that to any year-end tax bill. It's uncertain whether there will be a tax bill. If there is, again, uh, that would probably be one of those things that would uh, hitch a ride on the larger vehicle that is the omnibus funding bill. Uh, but you can see some other things in there too. Um, and the one exception that uh, might move on its own is that Eagle Act, which is an immigration related bill. But in terms of funding on the next slide, you'll see uh, some of the detail there. We are um, uh, running quickly uh, against a deadline uh, of the end of the week uh, for the government to remain open. So there is the, the government remains open on a continuing resolution, which is a bill to extend last year's funding levels into the current fiscal year. That ends, as you can see, at the end of the day on Friday. Uh, in the meantime, what is happening is that the top appropriators and the leadership are trying to hash out a deal uh, on the top line funding levels for uh, an omnibus funding bill, which in other words would be, in this case, all 12 regular appropriations bills uh, mashed up into one very large piece of legislation. So they don't yet have those top line numbers. Uh, and the, really what it's come down to is a disagreement between the parties on how much money uh, should be spent on domestic discretionary programs as opposed to the defense programs. There actually has been for some time now an agreement on the top line number for defense programs, but they can't agree on non-defense programs, we have received word as late as today that they're perhaps very close to getting a deal on those top line numbers, but it hasn't been uh, announced yet in any way. It could happen as soon as today, however. However, even if that happens, uh, today the Congress will need to pass another short-term resolution, most likely until the end of next week, till right before Christmas, uh, in order to give themselves time to uh, write that omnibus legislation and get it passed. And, you know, that would be a very compressed time frame uh, for doing an omnibus, and it could very well spill over into after Christmas. But, of course, they have to get all this done before the end of the year. Otherwise, you're spilling over into next Congress, and that's a whole other uh, ball of wax altogether. Uh, both sides of the aisle have floated the possibility of a year-long CR. Um, which would uh, mean that we wouldn't get, you know, funding increases for all of our key priority programs. Again, it would just, by and large, it would continue last year's funding levels for everything uh, throughout the uh, throughout the end of the year. Most uh, people up there don't really want that at all. There's something in it for everyone to get an omnibus pass. So uh, again, there's still optimism that's going to happen. And, and again, we have heard reports uh, just in the last day or so that progress is being made on the negotiations there. So still more to come uh, in terms of the year end uh, game here, uh, but uh, that's where we're standing for now. So I'm gonna turn it over to David and he's gonna take a little bit more of a look forward into the 118th month. Uh, thank you, Jim. Um, before I do that, um, uh, Jose or Rosario, do you have any comments you wanna make about um, what's um, happening between now and, and, and New Year's, um, we, we think? Yeah, so one one key thing that I think is working well for us and for everybody that wants to see an omnibus legislation is something that you'll probably talk about a little bit also, David, which is this is the end of the Congress. And this Congress in particular, we're seeing a lot of senators retiring and a lot of appropriators who are not returning due to retirements or any other reason. And so, like Jim said, there's a little bit of everyone for, for the little bit of everything for everyone on the bills. One of those pieces is the congressionally directed spending or community project funding projects that were in FY23 that if it doesn't get completed by the end of this year, it's unclear if the projects submitted by those retiring appropriators would still be there in the next Congress. So that's one thing that's working well for us. And let's just hope that Congress can get it to the finish line before Christmas.
Okay, well, um, why don't we move on then um, to outlining a little bit about what we're expecting to see um, early next year when um, you all are gonna be in Washington um, advocating on behalf of our, our students and our communities as part of the, um, the, the NLS. Um, first thing to remember, um, you all uh, know this, but it's useful to keep in mind that with the redrawing of the congressional districts after the 2020 census, that um, members are representing different um, constituencies in many cases, most cases um, to some extent, and that that may influence their priorities. It may even influence whether or not you're still in their district, although hopefully you've sorted that all out before you come to Washington and have made your appointments, which we'll talk about in a few moments. But that the um, you know the lines of influence um, have been um, you know recast uh, as a result of the census and of course the, um, the the recent election, which we're not going to talk about in any um, detail. As everybody knows, the um, Republicans have um, uh, taken over a majority in the House of Representatives with um, 222 votes at this point, which still leaves um, whoever is speaker. Um, probably Kevin McCarthy, but not a sure thing, um, leaves that person um, with a, um, a very narrow room for maneuvering and, and, and keeping um, their votes in line, whipping the party um, to get whatever they um, uh, want to through the House. Um, so the House will be Republican. The, Demo the Democrats, as you know, um, retain um, control of the Senate. Um, Senator Sinema, of course, just announced um, late last week that she was I'm uh, gonna be affiliating with neither party and, and being an independent, which changes dynamics as well. The um, first thing to, to know um, about the next Congress is that because the Democrats no longer control both chambers of the legislature as well as the White House, that the, their ability to move reconciliation legislation through uh, is gonna be curtailed. And so um, the uh, legislation, the, such as the American Rescue Plan, the um, Anti-Inflation um, Act um, that passed um, early this fall um, will not be uh, enacted um, this uh, or next year. Um, so we'll see a very different dynamic um, in Congress. Um, so uh, that we will be focusing much more when it comes to spending on the appropriations um, process um, that Jim described a little bit of and Jose added to. Uh, in terms of um, what will be likely to be um, the focus of um, activity in each of the chambers, um, we expect um, to a very large degree, particularly um, under the Education and Workforce Committee, um, which will very likely be chaired by um, uh, Senator, or excuse me, Representative Virginia Fox, um, that, um, that committee will focus very much on the Biden administration and their actions, um, particularly the loan cancellation policy, the income-driven repayment um, a, a policy changes that have been announced, if not implemented yet, and other administrative activities of the Department of Education. Um, the loan pause uh, as well, which is very expensive in terms of federal budget. So we expect there to be tough oversight um, coming from the House that said, um, Dr. Fox, of course, who's a former community college president, is very interested in, in moving Higher Education Act reauthorization legislation, Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act legislation, apprenticeship legislation. She's very focused on higher education job training and we expect to be very busy um, working with um, uh, her and her team uh, and the other committee members, both majority and minority um, on that, those, those bills. Um, in the Senate, um, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders uh, is going to be, uh, it's on the next slide, but I'll mention it now, is going to be chairman of the Health Committee. Ranking member will be Bill Cassidy from Louisiana. Um, they have different styles as legislators. I'll just mention it now. Senator Sanders is more of a, um, a big picture type of person, very far to the left, as everyone knows does not have a reputation as being someone who is, um, has a strong record of legislative accomplishment, but of course is very effective in articulating issues and motivating and mobilizing people behind him. He doesn't have a, a big track record in higher education. So to some extent, we will be focusing on um, 
you know, waiting to see what he does. Uh, Senator Cassidy is a bit more of a nuts and bolts style politician and is um, will probably be more interested in the concrete aspects of moving legislation, um, whether or not those two can find some middle ground and move things uh, on a consensus basis, which is what's required in the Senate um, remains to be seen. Um, but a, a larger point just for the Senate as a whole is the fact and this really cannot be overemphasized is that um, with the Democrats um, controlling at least at this point can, um, the Senate um, will make it much easier for um, President Biden to have his um, nominees um, either judicial or executive branch um, um, moved forward. And then finally, um, because we do expect to see less um, activity in the Congress and fewer bills signed by the president, and this last Congress was um, one where there was a lot of elect legislative um, accomplishment, um, we'll expect to see even more regulatory action taking place, uh, nature kind of abhorring a vacuum in terms of policy, we do expect to see regulations, gainful employment, perhaps Title IX. Um, we'll see some loan uh, implementation as well. So uh, we'll be seeing a lot in the executive branch. For those of you who are interested in that aspect of things, you know, your time in Washington would, would be well spent on visiting with agencies um, along with um, members of, of Congress. So um, next, next slide, um, just, gets um, over to a little bit about what you can expect when, when you're in town um, and some of the dynamics. First of all, we expect um, that the um, house office buildings will have, um, with the usual screening, open access, which has not been the case um, since the pandemic started. Um, we don't know about the Senate. Um, there may um, be escorts required um, to get in there. You'll have to work that out with individual um, offices. Uh, this was just um, touched upon on um, the issue that is of community projects and congressionally directed spending, but it's an open question at this point as to whether or not um, those that type of funding will be continued in um, the next Congress with, um, in particular, with re Republicans controlling the House. Historically, in recent years, they have not um, supported that and they eliminated them. Um, when they regain um, control of um, of the of the Congress in 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 2010, and so we um, uh, we do expect that there will certainly be a discussion on that area. And we know that many of you are waiting to see the resolution, of the appropriations process, to see whether um, your own uh, campus's projects will be will be funded. And um, I did um, mention um, the dynamics and the uh, leadership of the. Senate Health Committee. We also have going to have new in the Senate, new um, leadership on the Appropriations Committee. Uh, Senator Patty Murray from Washington is a longstanding community college champion and former faculty member. He is going to chair the Appropriations Committee, which is good news for us uh, as advocates. The ranking member, <coughs> excuse me, will be Senator Susan Collins from Maine. She's known for being something of a moderate. She's not so well known as being um, a strong supporter of community colleges, but she is. And so we're happy to see her in that key position um, as well. So I'll pause there and um, before turning things over to my colleagues at ACCT, and I guess if anybody else has anything they wanna add about the legislative landscape for next year, please go ahead. One quick thing that I'd just like to add, and I think you made a point to mention this, David, is that uh, it is not yet a sure thing whether Representative McCarthy will be the Speaker of the House. That is the most likely outcome. But regardless of who ends up being the Speaker, uh, it will be a Republican. And so we can be very certain that there will be a lot more access, public access to the House Capitol, um, House office buildings and the Capitol in the 118th Congress. Like I said, and like the slide says, the Senate might take a little bit more time, um, but we expect them to them for them to eventually follow suit uh, as the House did. Uh, it just might not be by the time the NLS comes around. Thanks, Jose. I think that is a really important point. Um, and related, someone pointed out to me yesterday uh, that you know we've been hearing uh, for about a year and a half now about shortages with the Capitol Police. And so one of the things that we'll continue to remind folks 
um, uh, as we get closer to February is to make sure you leave enough time to go through security. Because as these reopenings come, we, we expect that there could be some long lines. Uh, but, but thinking more of the content and back to David's uh, previous slide about how a divided Congress will mean we'll see a lot more administration and executive action, uh, as well as oversight from the House. Uh, one of the things that AACC and ACCT have done as we have been drafting the legislative priorities is to look for areas where we do expect to see um, some bipartisan consensus. Uh, so we will have a second webinar in January where, where we will unveil those legislative priorities. Uh, and you'll, you'll see some of our perennial favorites such as Pell funding, uh, but I think you'll see uh, some emphasis or some new topics uh, in areas where we expect uh, it's more likely to have bipartisan movement. And we're trying to be very thoughtful uh, given the political landscape and how we select those priorities um, to make sure that uh, we're working on issues that this Congress may actually be able to impact. Uh, so with that kind of pivot to forward looking, let me turn it to Jose and Rosario, who are gonna start talking about the preparation timeline. Thank you, Carrie. And before I leave this last slide, I just want to also add a quick fun fact, which is uh, next Congress will also be historical in one way, and that is that it will be the first time in history that what we call the Cardinals, the four leaders on the Appropriations Committee are women, with um, Chair Murray and Vice Chair Collins in the Senate, and then in the House, we expect to have um, Chair Granger, um, and uh, ranking member DeLauro. So four women in charge of the purse. And with that, we'll go on to some of our um, tips and tricks for how to prepare to the NLS starting now. Um, we broke it down month by month so you all have a sense of how what you should be doing now and how you can be proactive to prepare for your meetings with your legislators uh, in February. So starting with the basics, I think this is a good time especially as you get some downtime from, from work to familiarize yourself with your college and with your community. Uh, I'm sure you are very well aware of your college's programs and some of the, the most high performing or high enrollment programs, but it would be good to have a refresher on that. Um, it's also good as you, if you've already done this before, you know that you, brevity is always great when it comes to meeting, meetings on the Hill. So working with your college administrators and college leaders to draft a one pager on your college less is more oftentimes on the hill so a one pager highlighting some of those key programs key demographics key statistics for your campus and for your students and for the federal programs that impact them will be much better than trying to provide an entire catalog of your college or an entire research brief um, just because the Congress, the members of Congress themselves and their staff will not have the time to look at that. So that's one thing to consider. Find ways that you can make things more digestible and you can start doing that by refreshing your mind on what are some of those key issues and key programs and key uh, facts that your college and your community has. Another area to think about is that as trustees, um, and as community, community college leaders, you have one thing in common with your members of Congress, and that is that you share um, the same constituency. So thinking beyond the college campus, thinking about the needs of your community, thinking about ways that your college is addressing some of those needs. How are you helping the, uh, in terms of economic, but also civic engagement, access to better paying jobs, partnerships with employers. Those are some of the things you'll wanna highlight um, and bring forth to the table when you're meeting with your legislators. And then, like I mentioned earlier, what are some of those federal programs that are uh, taking place in your college that are helping your students? If there's one thing that members of Congress like to hear is how their current work is helping their constituents so that they can then turn around and brag about it and highlight it in their own channels. So think of the impact of programs like the Pell Grant, Strengthening Institutions Program, Strengthening Community College Training Grants, any community project funding or congressionally direct community funding projects or congressionally directed spending from FY22, if your campus has any, might be worth highlighting as well. And then going through the basics, 
And going back to the whole idea that this is the the Congress, the, the congressional districts may have been redrawn and there may be new boundaries and may, there may be new members, thinking about who it is that represents your institution and your students. Um, who is representing your college, who is representing the areas that you serve outside of your college district, um, and trying to connect with them and connect with how you are helping their constituents. Going into January, uh, one thing that you want to do is once you figure out who you're, the, the people you are meeting with or potentially people you are meeting with are and you have your basics down when it comes to your community, your college, your needs and your top highlights is looking at what are the key committees that are relevant to our institutions. Uh, we have a, a bit of an example on the slide there in front of you, but you know, Ed and Labor is what you'll hear the most of, especially from us as well as the Health Committee on the Senate. These are the committees that have jurisdiction over the Higher Education Act and all the laws that govern our institutions. But beyond that, you also have appropriations, which we touched on earlier this year, which seems to be the conversation throughout the year since they're still working on FY23, halfway through the fiscal year already almost. Um, but then you also have to think about other committees where your students or your institutions may be impacted. The Judiciary Committee, has jurisdiction over one of um, community colleges' longstanding priorities, and that is enacting the DREAM Act to protect DREAMers and DACA students. Um, as Carrie mentioned, we're looking at areas where we can find opportunities of bipartisanship that may be present in the next Congress, and one of those areas that aligns really well with some of the needs of our institutions and our students is the Farm Bill. Um, and that's uh, under the jurisdiction of the Agriculture Committee. The Farm Bill, um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture runs the uh, food, um, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, or as food stamps as is commonly known. Um, but they also run programs like SNAP Employment and Training, which many community colleges serve as providers for. So looking at areas in which we can talk to legislators to enhance and improve access to federal benefits program to tackle food insecurity, but also looking at programs where we can secure additional funding for on the workforce side for our institutions as well as one example. So thinking about if your if your members are on the on the agriculture committee, um, budget closely tied to appropriations, especially now that there is no funding caps, at least not for the time being. And as uh, David and Jim mentioned, uh, ways and means. One of the big items that we we still have pending in our priorities is the enhancement of um, the Pell Grant by making it tax-free um, and looking at the AOTC. So those are some issue areas that are under the jurisdiction of the Ways and Means Committee in the House and the Finance Committee um, in the Senate. So this is to say, think big picture, think beyond the tent, think outside of HEA and outside of health and, and labor and appropriations and look at what are some of the other areas that your institutions, your individual community, and your individual students may be getting impacted by. If your member is not in any of those committees, um, I can almost guarantee you that there are going to be issues under other jurisdictions that impact your community, your students' lives, or your institution. So be creative with that and think about that. So as you prepare um, to plan the meeting and coordinate with your group, with your leadership, uh, when you go into the meetings. You know, I would add, just add real quick to what Jose was talking about a second ago is not only concentrate on the things that you do have, the grants that you do have, and, you know, providing information about that, but what don't you have that you want? You know, a great talking point is we like go in is like, listen, we applied for a strengthening community college training grants program grant, for instance, and say, you know, this is what we will we'll do with that if we got a grant, but we want this program to be larger. So we have, you know, more opportunity to get that grant, that sort of thing. So look to the, kind of look to the other side of the ledger too, in terms of the information that you're bringing in terms of your advocacy. Thank you, Jim, that's great. And that was perfect timing because I was wanna, going to pause and see if any, everybody, anybody in the, in the call had anything else to share. If there's no other comments, I'm gonna turn it over to Rosario to take us on the next two slides. Thank you, Jose. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that one's perfect. So continuing on with January, it's going to be a pretty busy month as we are preparing for NLS. 
Um, one key thing is that you're going to need to request those meetings with your federal legislatures, which, um, you know, we want to maybe do try to get those in early January. So then you can make sure um, that you're giving ample time to your offices to process those requests. And um, just one thing to note is that in some cases, your um, state associations may also be coordinating and sending requests for Hill meetings. So you're going to need to make sure you're talking to them and only sending one to avoid any duplicate requests to your member of Congress's office. Um, so in addition to actually making sure you have a meeting <laughs> in the queue, um, you're going to also want to um, fill out the federal funds worksheet that we've provided. and. Um, I'm sure we'll send these slides out around to everyone so you guys can have the links, but it's also on our NLS website. And that worksheet, basically what it's gonna do is show the impact of federal education dollars on your campus and how far those are stretching <laughs> for your students. And that um, just like Jose was just mentioning, it's a great way to kind of um, just give some examples of how these dollars are impacting your specific campus and the more information and the more um, examples that you're able to show to the member of Congress and their staff um, of how much further extra money could go or, or the, really the needs of your students on your campus, um, it, it'll be much more helpful to them so that they know um, what's going on in their district or state. And then you're also going to want to research your member of Congress's background. Um, you know, do they have any ties with community colleges? Have they attended any previous events that your Congress, uh, that your college has hosted? Um, and if so, kind of what those events were, you know, you want to really get into the nitty gritty, have you or your staff met with them prior, and what have you been discussing? Part of this um, is to just make sure that, you know, you're continuing to build those relationships or or where, or to get a better picture of where you're starting from. Maybe you don't have those relationships yet. They could be a new member of Congress, but all of this um, to say is that we want you to be as best prepared for your meetings as possible and just to understand um, any interactions or previous relationships that you guys have had. Um, if you've collaborated prior as well. And then um, also uh, you're, with the team that you're going to be um, going in this meeting on, you need to coordinate and decide what your two to three top issue areas are going to be during your meeting. Um, you know, we want to use the time effectively. So you want to have a couple main priorities that you want to focus on and dedicate time to as, you know, um, as there's questions or further comments that they might have, you want to make sure you have ample time to discuss these and not kind of trail off and or get into the weeds much. Um, and then that's kind of what you want to be doing January. I think we'll um, head to February next. Um, so just kind of, uh, you know, reiterating in February, you're going to really want to plan that meeting <laughs> agenda and uh, make sure your group is on the same page when it comes to messaging, again, to make sure you guys are concise and hitting all the points that you want to be hitting, assign a lead to help kick off the meeting and ensure you guys stay on topic. Um, and if you have a student with you, make sure to spotlight them and have them share their personal impact story. Again, that'll be helpful for um, your member to get a better picture of you know, a, a real life student's perspective and, and how they can help them specifically. Um, and then post meeting, um, we've recently introduced a congressional contact form. And what that is, is that it allows us to um, better inform our advocacy efforts here in Washington, DC. So when once you meet with your member of Congress, it doesn't only have to be for NLS, it can be for any meetings that you have afterwards. Um, we want, we're asking you all to fill out this form because it'll give us a better idea of what you're meeting with your members of Congress for, what you guys are discussing, what priorities um, you're bringing up to them, and maybe if if they've you know made any commitments to you, it helps us better understand the relationship you have, and then um, we can continue the conversation here. Like um, for example, we just had um, some of our appropriations meetings um, in this fall, you know, leading up, up to um, the funding cycle, and so um, when we were going back to our notes, we can look back to notes and see, oh, this. This college, they've been um, meeting with their Congress member. They've been talking about this, so we kind of know what priorities um, to better tailor to your to your specific member of Congress. So we do ask that you fill out the contact form. All all it, um, the information you um, have to kind of fill out is like who you met with, maybe what staffers were present, what you discussed. It's pretty easy. Um, and then also make sure to send a thank you email and include uh, an electronic um, form of, of any of the materials that you brought with you. So, um, just so you know, this it can get to the appropriate staffers. 
And then um, any other additional information or relevant um, material to the topics that you all discussed, like maybe if you told them you were gonna follow up and get them more information on um, a certain program, you make sure you follow up and use that email to send those along. And then um, after the meeting, it's always just really important to make sure you're following up regularly and strengthening that relationship. NLS is only once a year, but we want to make sure you're you're keeping in constant contact with your members of Congress um, so that you guys can build a stronger relationship and um, that can better inform your advocacy efforts as well. And then hey, I'm going to turn it over to Carrie to close us out. Thank you, Rosario and Jose. Um, I'll ask here just in a second if anyone has anything to add on the preparation timeline. Uh, but I'm going to draw it out a moment uh, to encourage folks to put their questions uh, in either the chat box or the Q&A. Uh, so I'll ask if anyone, uh, if any of the panelists have any other comments uh, on the timeline shared, uh, and then uh, we'll move into Q&A and I will read out those questions for the panelists to respond. Uh Two quick things, Carrie, and on the congressional contact form, just to reiterate everything that Rosario said, it's very helpful to us when you do fill it out because not only do we get to hear about your advocacy, but we can also see what are some of the concerns or what's top of mind for members of Congress. And if there are several meetings taking place, we can try to identify patterns and see what, what the, general, the general thought is with some of our elected officials which can then help the way we take we, we tackle our advocacy efforts for the remainder of the year. Um, and then to just re, to piggyback off of the last item that Rosario mentioned, which is regularly follow up and strengthen that relationship. If you think about it, we're coming in to meet uh, the first week of February. If knock on wood, Congress finalizes an omnibus appropriations bill by the end of this year, then we're looking at the start of the fiscal year 2024 process in late February, early March. Now, who knows whether we're going to see an FY24 with a divided Congress, but in the event that we do, it's a really good opportunity to start having those conversations with your elected officials on whether or not they are going to have community, fund, community project funding um, and congressionally directed spending if um, the Republican majority decides they want to pursue that in the next Congress. And I would just add, just in terms of the logistics uh, and the timeline, just to keep in mind that if, if in fact, your member of Congress that you're trying to get a meeting with is a, one of the new members of Congress, just keep in mind the fact that they will just be staffing up uh, during this uh, you know period of time that we've been talking about. Uh, and so there might be a little bit more, uh, you know, it could be a little bit more closer to the date in terms of when they get that together and are, you know, kind of fully up and running. Um, so just something to keep in the back of your mind as you're communicating with those officers. Thank you all. Um, so to move into question and answer, uh, we have a couple different uh, questions in here regarding the timing of the priorities or the green sheet. Uh, so first, I will say that uh, I started in this role five days before NLS last year. And so for other folks who may be new, and this is their first NLS, I spent the first several days at work being like, what is the green sheet? I'm so confused. Uh, so the green sheet is the short version of our legislative priorities. Uh, ACCT and AACC's board uh, jointly pass the same legislative agenda for each Congress. Um, that is to make sure that community colleges have a unified voice on Capitol Hill. Uh, and we do a... Uh, bro uh, uh, brochure, bulleted list of uh, any priority that we think might come up over the course of a Congress, uh, which you can imagine is very high level and a long list of items. Uh, so for each NLS, uh, working with our policy committees on our boards, uh, Jose and I just met with uh, ACCT student trustee committee recently um, to receive their feedback and talking across the staff. Uh, we try to narrow down that list to the top priorities that are also the most timely uh, to focus on at NLS. Um, so that is what we are actively working on now. Uh, we do plan to release that in January. I hear the calls for the sooner the better. Um, however, with the omnibus uh, yet to form, 
and this being the end of a Congress, we expect there to be several changes uh, over the next two weeks. So we want to make sure that we're rolling out priorities that make the most sense possible for February, and we're just going to have a much better sense of that in the first week of January uh, when we know the final numbers in the omnibus. Uh, as a reminder, Congress is supposed to do this by the end of September. So in years uh, where they do the appropriations earlier or in years where it's not the end of a Congress, but the middle, it's easier to get them out earlier. But uh, both being a new Congress and still having the omnibus appropriations bill outstanding means that we that we want to make sure uh, that we know the information in there before we uh, you know, before we release it, as there, there could be some changes. Um, so with that, let me move to the first question I see here in the queue. Um, are there other meetings that you recommend we try to schedule during our time in D.C. other than with members of Congress? For example, foundations, other organizations of interest, um, any department or administration, uh, is that even feasible given the schedule? I'll, I'll go first on that one. It, uh, it actually wasn't even listed. Uh, you know, one thing we, uh, particularly from Scott Jashik at Inside Higher Ed, have always heard from him over the years is that community college people don't visit them uh, to talk about what they're doing. So that's another thing I would think about in terms of, you know, if you have a good story to tell, something you think that might be of interest, uh, check in with the folks at the Chronicle of Higher Education and Inside Higher Education while you're uh, while you're here. I'd also add that, as I mentioned in passing, that um, depending on your institution and the uh, funds that your college receives um, from the federal government, that you might want to reach out to uh, individuals within the agencies um, to um, speak with them about the programs that are under their jurisdiction. It could be, um, you know, more na more narrowly focused, uh, such as the Institutional Assistance Division, which oversees the um, Title III and Title V programs. It could be um, the Office of Career and Technical Education um, in the Department of Education. It could be the Employment and Training Administration or otherwise if you get grants from them. You know, making contacts with people in those agencies can be just a very useful way of um, enhancing your uh, possibilities of getting a grant support um, down the line and just making the connections with, um, with, with, um, with people that can, um, Grease the skids a little bit, um, and um, you know they're, they're, they they can't award you the, the grant just because you showed up. But you might gain some valuable information about you know uh, putting together a successful application. So we do encourage that. Thank you, Jim and David. Uh, moving to our next question, uh, thinking about timing with the priorities coming out in January, should be we wait for those priorities to be released before reaching out to members of Congress? No. <laughs> How is that? Uh, short, short answer, no. Um, and that is because while members of Congress don't necessarily need a long lead for meeting requests, you don't also want to send them one at the very last minute or even the week before, because especially as when we're in NLS, it's also they're in session, so they do have votes there. Uh, depending on how active the Congress is at the start of it, they may have several um, voting sessions or they may have just one e on each day. I think generally speaking, you want to frame the meeting request as talking about community college priorities or community college issues or your students. Um, you can mention some specifics that you know even before our green sheet comes out are important to your college. Uh, but they don't necessarily need to know all the fine details and like every specific issue area that you're going to tackle. So um, I think we recommend that you start reaching out to your members of Congress early January. You might not have the green sheet in front of you until the second half of January. So I would not wait. Thank you, Jose. I see one question uh, left in the queue. So I'm going to do a last call. If you have a question, please put it in now. Um, and if not, this will be our last question. Uh, will there be any special sessions or programming for student trustees? Um, so, Jose, oh, Rosario, please, yes, go for it. So um, we'll drop the 
the link to the website in the chat, but there's a schedule at a glance section in the NLS website that gives you kind of a, a general breakdown. And on Monday, we at 1215, from 1215 to 315, we have the student session. And then later on that day, we also have the student trustee advisory committee meeting from 330 to 430. Um, and I know there was also part of a question kind of asking how much time you'll have for meetings. You'll also be able to see there that we have um, Tuesday and Wednesday, you have a lot of time for meetings. Um, you have, we have scheduled like morning visits um, time, and then we have an afternoon visits slot there for Tuesday and then Wednesday as well. But make sure to check out the schedule at a glance. I'll, I'll drop the link in the chat now. And just to clarify, because maybe I heard it wrong. Uh, the student session is 2.15 to 3.15. I heard 12.15. So um, we do have, uh, we do plan to have some student specific content at the NLS and, and they do have uh, their, the student, our ACCT student trustee advisory committee is scheduled to meet. Um, so that's a really great opportunity for the students to, student trustees to network amongst their peers from across the country. Um, and to come together and share how they can be better advocates for their institutions. Uh, and like Rosario said, we do intentionally pack Monday. Monday is pretty heavy when it comes to programming. We front load that for you all so you can get all the information before you go off to the Hill or to the agencies. Uh, but Tuesday and Wednesday are relatively light so that you have ample time to meet with stakeholders. Thank you all. Uh, the last question I see here is a logistic one. Will these slides be shared with us via email? Yes, we will certainly share those. I think as uh, Jose mentioned earlier, uh, we are also recording this session. So the recording will be available, uh, though I know flipping through the slides is certainly faster. So we'll make sure that both of those resources are out there. Um, and we'll be putting those on the NLS website as well. Uh, as I said, you know, uh, many attendees for the event may not have been able to join us live today. Uh, but I know we'll want to go back and uh, revisit those materials. Um, so not seeing any more questions, uh, we are going to close out today's session. Thank you to David, Jim, Jose, and Rosario uh, for serving as panelists and sharing such great information today. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you all here in Washington uh, in, in uh, about two months. Thank you again.